Microsoft is selling Windows 8 upgrades for cheap, and Firefox is now a mobile operating system. Hey everyone, and welcome to Tech and Coffee's Tech News Week, the show where we break down the week's tech news and offer our opinions. I'm Duke Carrico, and joining me today is the cast and crew from Tech and Coffee. And welcome everyone. Let's go down from left to right. We've got Bruce Turner from Virginia, Guy Cook from Washington, Joseph Youssef from North Carolina, Matt Janey from Oklahoma, and George Dosher from North Carolina. Hey, guys, how we doing? Doing great. Pretty good. Uh, all right. Let's get into this. Apple's, uh, Apple's halted the sale of the Galaxy Nexus in the U.S., guys, and uh, uh, Google has pulled the Nexus from their Play Store and said that they pulled it due to the injunction. They've offered an uh, over-the-air update, but I have not heard of anyone receiving it yet. So uh, what's your thoughts on this, guys? Another patent war between Apple and Google. What's your thoughts? I think uh, basically it's the standard thing Apple's going to pull forever and ever. <laughs> They're gonna they're gonna fight anybody who they they think they have some sort of patent against or whatever. So um, it's hard to say. I mean, seriously, uh, I, I think Apple tries to pick fights with almost anyone. And uh, I'll be honest, I don't know what judge was, was, could have possibly thought that that could have been disputable. I mean, the idea of search has been in existence since the beginning of the computer. I mean, it's the basis of how it functions to search for an, a, a command in order to run it. Just because you can do um, commands via voice, that's been around since uh, Windows 3.1, you know, pre-Windows 95. They just, they just now figure out a way to get around to where it could be actually viable to use. That doesn't make it patentable. That just means they got it to work right. Well, there's plenty of ridiculous precedents like slide to unlock, a wedge shape, a rectangle shape. That you know, it's it's sad that we've gotten into the into nothing but uh, stacking up patent portfolios against each other rather than really stacking up new innovation. Uh, you know, I think we're really going down a, a spiral of a place where uh, you know you're going to have uh, companies that part of their entire uh, plan is going to be stacking up patents against folks for revenue. You got uh, Nokia now uh, trying to question the uh, the uh, new Galaxy tablet. I mean, you might have somebody like uh, Research in Motion or some of these other companies that are on their way out that are going to be doing nothing but creating revenue by stacking up uh, uh, old patents against folks and trying to make claims. It's a pretty uh, sad place to be, and I think that I think that hopefully, since we're fighting it out now with with Apple being in the big picture. Uh, I hope that they'll come out with enough egg on their face and some backlash that maybe we'll be able to stop this kind of a spiral down down the the, uh, the uh, patent wars and get back into some innovation. Yeah. yeah, it's interesting. In preparation for tonight's show, I I watched uh, the All About Android show, which was taped, I believe, this past Tuesday. And sure enough, they had quite a set. Of course, they, they are all back from Google I.O., and they all had their swag there, you know, their... Nexus 7 tablets and their Q and their Nexus phone and everything, but I knew they would have, and they did, a section on patents. And uh, it was quite an interesting discussion about all the, the patent wars that are going on. It's interesting also to do a search on Google. Just do a search using um, Apple boycott as a term. It was a trending uh, topic in, in Google Plus, uh, I believe, as early as a couple of days ago. And, uh, you know, narrow down that search to just within the last month and look at how many hits there are. It's definitely got some people very, uh, very concerned about Apple's legal strategy. And uh, if I see one more patent war against, like, placement of home buttons or volume controls, I'm going to join that Apple boycott. And this will go out the window. By the way, uh, welcome, uh, Alex. Uh, you uh, you came in after we got started, everyone. Yeah. Alex Janko, and where are you from, Alex? I'm in the Detroit area. Okay, okay, very good. All right, uh, listen, uh, is this turning into a PR nightmare for Apple? All of this where Apple suing HTC and and Samsung is is this? Uh, uh, I mean, is, are are we starting to pay attention? You know, because because Apple's been at this for a while, but normally it's in Germany or Europe. Uh, it's starting to hit home now. 
You know, it's here in the United States. Is it? Uh, is it just our perception here on Google Plus that this is turning into a PR nightmare for Apple? Well, I dude, think I, it is. I think that the the Apple users I know are not talking about it. If you say, well, hey, what about the lawsuit? What about the you know the thing with Google? Oh, I I don't want to discuss that right now. It's you know they'll they'll sort it all out and 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 they want to stay true to their Mac or their iPhone or whatever Apple product that they're uh, tied up money with, and not really get into the fact that the company has kind of got like a dark side now. Oh my gosh. Yeah, yeah they're completely arrogant if they don't think that they've got a PR problem here. Uh, again, actually, does that dark side include their exploding batteries? <laughs> yeah, you could call that a dark side. Yeah, I think that's probably accurate. Uh, I'm going to have to disagree with you guys. I, I just don't think Joe Public is really as aware of of all the uh, the lawsuits and the thing on the news. I mean, just think about who the people who tend to buy um, iPhones and and, uh, and Apple devices. They tend to be uh, people who are under the age of 25. Clueless. And more women <laughs> than men. No, no, I'm not going to say clueless, but they look at different things for their for their um, news sources. How often do you see those news sources talk about patent disputes right now? Um, you know, when was the last time you talked to your sister or to your wife and say, "Hey, are you aware of what patent stuff on there?" I don't think they're aware of it. I really well, don't. Joe, I think we're just a lot more. Happen, though, when you think about how many people are buying Android devices right now and how many are being activated each day, you, you take a look at, uh, at pick any demographic, whether it's the, you know, uh, you know, 13 through 16 year olds, 16 through 20 year olds, something else like that. They've all got friends that have Android phones and have iPhones. I think they're having some discussions about these things, more so than we might think. But I, I think your point is well taken, though. Like I said, I, I I've never heard. A, I, I was just going to say, Joe, that uh, uh, all my wife really cares about her iPhone is that she can text and send pictures and receive pictures. You know, she's, she's really not up on... Uh, any kind of litigation that Apple might have against, you know, Android companies. So uh, I, I do. Your point is well taken. All I right, have guys. this. Uh, Go ahead I have now. this funny image that you guys should probably see here. I'll turn on screen share and this window here. Show this like window. Um, I saw this on the Google Plus feed the other day, and um, I thought it was kind of funny. It's the uh, Samsung F700, I believe that would be the, no, it's not the first Galaxy S phone. Anyways, they basically sued them for having the same shape phone, having rectangular, or er, square icons, and I believe this is, this isn't the official version of the Samsung phone. I believe it was actually running Android, but um, it has a home button in the center. No, it wasn't. I'm wrong no, about that. This is this is actually what that's uh, representing is Samsung was taking that approach to devices uh, prior to the iPhone, Apple introducing the iPhone. That's what that that photo represents. Correct. Anyways, um, I also saw another thing on Google Plus talking about um, the uh, Galaxy S original Galaxy S. The way Google or Apple sued them for having the candy bar shape with rounded corners, having a home button in the center, and having square icons with rounded corners. Yeah, and and the phone on the left predates the iPhone on the right. Okay, that yeah, that phone was in production before the iPhone was. Yeah, it shows the release dates, Alex. Look right at the top in the fine print. The one's released in February. One's released in June. Oh, it does. It's kind of like the chicken and the egg. Which one came first? Well, this one is dated, so you don't have to wonder. Yeah, I, I didn't see that because it's kind of tiny there. Yeah, okay. always read the fine print. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hey, guys, Hey guys, just one more question, and then we're going to move on. Though. Uh, is this litigation between all of these tech companies, is this ever going to end? What's going to take to end it? I, I actually think it's going to take Joe Consumer to get irritated with it. I, I don't think Apple thinks there's anything wrong for that simple fact that I mentioned. Joe User doesn't know what's going on until the Joe Public becomes aware and starts and, and they can see that they're becoming irritated with it. I think that's when, you know, they might call a truce somehow. But and one one judge has already said he doesn't even think there should be patents for software. 
There we go. Now my well, you know, oh, yeah. the the slide to unlock Patton is, uh, I mean, to to me anyway, that looks like a ridiculous Patton. Okay, I mean, if you uh, go look at any deadbolt, it's what what happens to the deadbolt when it moves to lock and unlock? There, there you go. There you exactly, exactly. And and uh, I, I mean, you know, I'm obviously I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> Uh, your friend Mike Phillips might uh, he might totally disagree with me, but to me the the fact that uh, that someone granted them that type of patent just shows me that uh, a lot of these patents people uh, let's just put it to whoever was issuing those patents didn't really understand what the what they were issuing. That's just my opinion. Well, well, you know, Duke, uh, most patent lawyers aren't actually technical or ever came from a scientific or a technical background. Most of them, you know, came from political science majors or business majors or from whatever and then got their law degree. In many um, law schools, to, be get, you know, to become specialized in patent law, it's just one class. That's not saying it's bad or it's good. It's just saying it just shows that, that difficulty of the people that are coming in to understand patent law how far away that is for them to try and grasp such concepts dealing with technical intellectual property rights. Absolutely, absolutely. That's, that's a good point. Okay, next topic, guys. Windows 8 is going to offer a $40 upgrade for existing Windows XP. I did say XP. XP, Vista, and 7 customers. And, uh, wow, I'm telling you... Uh, uh, forty dollars sounds like a pretty good upgrade price to me. What do you guys think? I should probably put in a note there before we even get started. XP only uh, counts for people who have a gig of RAM and a one gigahertz processor and at least sixteen gig, preferably twenty gigs of free space on their hard drive. And Just so, a, what? Yeah, there there is some limitations there on an XP system. That's is, is that's your point, some, correct? Mm. Yeah, because like I have this computer down here that has a quarter mega RAM. Um, uh, I think it's a gigahertz processor and a, only a twenty gig hard drive. It is not eligible for the upgrade. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, let me let me post this question. Uh, I know. Let's see. We've got. I know we've got a Linux a, a uh, Linux preferred user in the room, and George. <laughs> Who is going to take advantage of this $40 upgrade price? I have to. Okay. Not because I want to. I, I qualified it with I have to. As a web developer with hundreds of customers, they're all going to expect their websites to be compliant and work right with Internet Explorer 10. That's the new browser that's coming. And so if it doesn't work, I have problems. Internet Explorer 10 will actually be available on Windows 7. It's just the Metro UI interface, which is plug-inless, is where you'll have trouble. You'll have to disable add-ons and stuff if you want yeah, to. Yeah, and I, I, I actually would probably take advantage of that because it is so cheap. Um, just, just to have at least one machine running the newest OS and to learn it. and Because uh, part of my job is to actually... I mean, I, I support Microsoft products, even though I don't actually use them at home. So um, I, I might actually go, oh, you know, i got a couple legitimate XP boxes sitting here. <laughs> I might just take them up on that offer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, might, I, I might take them up. Go ahead. I'm sorry, Matt. Go ahead. All right. Go ahead, Bruce. Well, I, I might take them up on the offer. I probably will. But here's another interesting point. Would I take them up on that offer? for my wife's laptop. You see, you've got to consider you're the family <laughs> IT person <laughs> and do you want to have to tra train everybody on how to use a new operating system? Yeah, because you you can expect to get emails. Hey, should I do this? <laughs> At that price, if they offer me anything new, uh, I'm going to be really tempted to go ahead and upgrade to it. You know, for me, I'm really glad they're going down at that price because from what I can tell, and I haven't really extensively tried out the... Uh, the Windows 8 uh, demo yet, but uh, you know, from what I've seen of it, really the only thing new is that Metro interface. And unless I'm in, an, in, a, in a device that's a newer laptop or a, a new screen that has a touchscreen interface, I don't see much use for it, for the Metro. Uh, the first thing I'm going to want to do is turn that right off. You know, uh, I'm glad that we're going to a place that we're building uh, a bridge between tablet computing and regular operating system desktop computing. 
uh, I'm glad that we're bridging that. And in fact, I think Microsoft doing a lot of really cool innovation right now. Whether I think any of it is something I'm going to jump into or whether it's going to succeed or not is another question. But we'll let them take the knocks and push things forward a little bit is the way I see it. Uh, but for forty dollars, you know, I'm going to be tempted to if they offer anything that I can see at the, in the base operating system under the Metro interface, you know, I may likely upgrade. I'm going to be I'm going to take my time and I'm going to see how it works for other folks before I do. Uh, because you know we, we always have a history of every other operating system really being worthwhile on Microsoft, uh, but uh, you know I'm going to be tempted to at that price. I think that's going to tempt a lot of people to want to have the latest, greatest, where they might be shy otherwise. You know, Metro's Metro's got off to a bad start as far as uh, public opinion and all of the consumer versions. Uh, uh, yet Microsoft has held its guns that you know they're going to stick with this Metro interface. Do you think the uh, this uh, forty dollar price point is a way to uh, uh, maybe just uh, really uh, get sales off real quick and get people using it? And you know, uh, it's kind of, it's kind of like a phone. Everybody says, "Oh, your phone's too big, too big." Well, I've been using this big phone for a couple of months now. I don't think I don't even consider it big anymore. You know what I mean? You, is that the uh, note? You Yes, you, you, what I, but my point being, you get to using something. Well, it's just like now. I use I use Windows now, man. The the thought of using Linux scares me to death because I'm comfortable in Windows, you know. And and I look at this Metro interface as uh, along those same lines. Anybody got any thoughts uh, any differently? No, actually, I think you're right on the money in that. You know, Microsoft is really at a at a pivot point right now in terms of it possibly losing, you know, uh, subscribers or, or, or users in, in mass quantities. I mean, you had people that came out with Windows, Windows XP and they thought it was beautiful. It was sublime. Then, West, then Vista came out. And while it had its own, you know, uh, fallouts, Windows 7, well, people bought, they still hung on to their Windows XP machines because Vista was so bad. Windows 7, it was just really Vista done right. So people just kind of waited out. Well, right now, people are at a pivotal point in their, you know, I, in their home IT infrastructures where they just can't hold on to their PCs anymore. They got to buy a new one. Well, when they go to buy a new one, do they buy Microsoft or do they buy an Apple? And right now, this is a make or break, I think, for for uh, Microsoft. They've lost a lot of headway in terms of um, uh, of uh, of use. I mean, you went from just five years ago, five years. Uh, where five, where Microsoft owned ninety five percent of the desktop market, and now they're there eighty five percent. That's a huge loss. Just imagine what it would be if Windows eight becomes a bust. Mm -hmm. Well, this kind of goes know, back to your. Everyone, this kind of go goes back to your argument, though, about the, the the iPhone and the Android or the patent. You know, the iPhone users that are the are you know I address them as clueless. They're really not clueless, but people who are not as concerned and don't hear a lot about these patent discussions. There's a lot of people uh, in the same vein who, who have a Windows 7 machines, and they're going to jump on Windows 8 just because it's the next thing. They're just going to move along with it without any concerns because they don't hear about some of the gripe and complaining that we in the tech uh, world hear about the people's unhappiness with the Metro interface. They're going to see it. Wow, that looks nice. Eye candy. I'm going to get it. It's like we got double George down there. Yeah, I think we had a little glitch there, and George rejoined there. Yeah. Uh, appreciate you, George. Appreciate you being but, on top of that. No problem. It didn't kill the feed at all, believe it or not. I'm watching the feed. So. One last ah, thing I want to add, though, about this Windows 8, and, and this is because I live in the Northwest. The standard rule of thumb on Windows products, whether it's an operating system, a mouse, anything that comes from the giant software company, is you wait a year for the service pack and then they'll have it fixed and it'll be right now this time they're saying Windows 8 you don't have to do that we've already done the homework we have fine-tuned it it's great well I've got the release the consumer release running as a virtual machine uh, there's a couple of eyes that aren't dotted um, like it's not in user intuitively friendly how do you turn thing off and I think there's some issues related to that that are going to make support people quite busy. Are you running the release or the consumer preview? The consumer preview. Uh, the release preview is a little bit more smoothed over. I mean, they still have the charm bar to get to the shutoff. 
point, but... Yeah, but I mean, it's enough different, I think, Alex, that there's some hurdles that are going to pre be presented to what we're calling Joe user. No offense, Joseph. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, really, though, uh, wouldn't you think this pricing is more in line with what Apple's been doing for years? And, and by the way, you know, this isn't the first time Microsoft has has offered a cheap, uh, you know, I think, uh, was it... Uh, was it Vista upgrade they offered for fifty dollars for a limited time? I I, I know it was one. No, it was seven. It was seven. Was it seven? Okay. Yeah, because they wanted to get everyone off Vista as fast as they could. Okay. A actually, Duke, um, that has not been a history of uh, Apple uh, making uh, cheap uh, operating system um, uh, sales. That was only a recent thing, especially after they uh, switched over to the uh, Intel chipsets. And they're really marketing very, very hard to try to encourage people to get over towards uh, the Mac side. And so the introductory press of the upgrade, it was less for the Mac user, but more for the Windows user saying, look, we can upgrade our stuff, and it's so much cheaper. Because that's only been for the last two releases that they were selling it for so cheap. Mm -hmm. I would think, too, I mean, uh, it's hard to believe how many XP units are still running out there. You know, the netbook kind of revived the whole XP OS. I think Microsoft uh, uh, did that just to probably try to kill off Linux in a lot of these netbooks. But uh, uh, there's still a lot of XP computers out there. And I'll tell you right now, if uh, I think I've got, I've got two XP systems sitting over here, and I, I might have to consider awfully hard you know, uh, up, upgrading to Windows 8 if if that'll do it, you know? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I actually have uh, XP system and then my Windows 7 system here, both of which are compatible with uh, the Windows 8 upgrade. And that one I found out actually is 2 gigs of RAM, so I was kind of surprised at that. Uh, Duke may not want to let George hear you there because uh, he might try to encourage you to go to uh, Linux Mint or some other well, Linux I'll tell operating you, I, system. I, I, I want to do that, Joe. I really, in fact, I've got a system over here. I'm, I think I'm going to take the the uh, the Mint Linux plunge here very soon. That's the mm -hmm. honest truth. And you, you I'm going to be talk to I'm me, George. No, I was just going to say I'll be relying on you very heavily when I do. Yeah. Well, what, what I was thinking earlier when you were talking about the Metro UI and you were sitting there saying something to the effect of, you know, that you were scared to go Linux because it's a completely different feel than your traditional Windows that you've been using. Um, well, you know, come over to the dark side. Actually, um, Linux Mint looks very traditional into a GUI. I mean, I'm not saying it looks like XP or anything like that, but you have a menu. It doesn't say start menu. You have a taskbar. And you have a standard desktop, so you could say it's kind of XP looking ish. Wait, okay. isn't it uh, based off of GNOME 3, which doesn't have a bottom uh, bottom bar? I can't see it. panel. Well, actually, yeah, actually, I'm using Cinnamon, um, and also um, my ah. laptop's using Mate. Uh, I decided to play with Mate on, uh, but the two GUIs for Linux Mint is Mate, which is based off loosely off GNOME 2, and then. Um, Cinnamon, which is based off GNOME 3, but they, but it's a classic style GNOME. It actually has a lower taskbar. Mate has two taskbars. It's got a lower one and an upper one. So it's yeah, a very classic. Yeah, I know they did that with Lisa as well. Yeah. But I was thinking in their next release that's coming out, uh, Linux Mint 13, the isn't it already in release candidate or beta or something? I no, it's out right now. Oh, it is. Oh. Yeah, I've been using it for almost a month now. It's been released. Oh, oh that's what Cinnamon is? Oh, yeah, I, it's Cinnamon and me, the two, two release candidates. And, I mean, they're not uh, release candidates. They are full releases. I'll have to pull that up real quick because I haven't okay. been on there for a couple months. Well, we should probably move on because we're actually yeah. not talking Linux right now. <laughs> that, that's, yeah. that's, that's cool. That's cool. It, it was all relevant. Uh, okay, okay, guys, next topic. Next topic. Uh, Maya. Firefox yeah. is now a mobile operating system. And uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> well, you know, listen. According to this report here, uh, let me let me share this, and maybe you guys can see it. Uh, uh, it's it looks like, according to this article, that they've got a little support. You've got uh, Dutch Telecom. Uh, man, I'm not even going to try to pronounce that one. There, my Tennessee accent will really come through on that one. Smart Sprint, uh, Telecom, Italia, Telefonica, 
uh, they're all in support of uh, Mozilla's Firefox OS through the extent that, uh, you know, of that support does remain unclear. But uh, basically what this article is pointing to, and, and I think it's actually a pretty good strategy, is that they're basically concentrating on uh, third world countries. Uh, you know, they're developing markets. Maybe uh, iOS and Android is a little bit out of reach to uh, to a lot of the uh, uh, you know, uh, those people there in those countries, and uh, this might be a way to actually break into uh, to the uh, the smartphone operating system. What do you guys think? I, I, I think actually, it's a Symbian replacement. That's I'm just thinking it's uh, yeah. Symbian's now dead thanks to Nokia siding with Microsoft and destroying its own operating <laughs> system. Actually, it's a popular belief, um, uh, Duke. Um, it's actually these other countries, third world countries, where the more expensive phone have been much more prevalent, and they're much more willing to pay the top dollar to get the all-in-one gadget because when they spend that much money, they want something that you know they can get the most bang for their buck. So uh, people over the overseas have been more okay with spending four, five, six, seven, even eight hundred dollars for a phone because they're used to it. They don't subsidize phones like we do here, so they're definitely more okay with it. But I think you're right in the fact that as an emerging market, people might be more interested in trying different things because they have no problem buying it, and if they don't like it, they'll just sell or trade off because it holds its resale value a lot more than it would here in the U.S. Well, if it's a uh, new market and, and nobody else is really jumping on it and being aggressive about it, then they, I think they have an opportunity there. Mm -hmm. Another opportunity would be if it runs on really simple hardware, you know. If it's a, you know... A, uh, not a terribly taxing OS, and you could run it on uh, older hardware. I mean, there'd be a lot of affordable hardware that's, you know, six months, 12 months old that we're practically throwing away as useless and, and having no value that could be uh, marketed to a lot of places with a, with a new hardware to refresh it, sort of like taking an old laptop and running Linux on it. And, and maybe you could even run it on a Motorola Razor. <laughs> hey, that was a great phone. That's a good one. Do we yeah. say razor here? Yeah. Sorry, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the first razor he's saying you can possibly run the Firefox OS. Is this the uh, do not track OS that they talking about for a little while? Mm, no, I don't think this is a do not track. This is a. This is just a. It is a uh, boot to gecko was the platform, and uh, uh, now they've renamed it ah, Firefox OS. Uh, boot to gecko, that's what it was called. Do not so track. So is it really a, a Firefox product feature. then, or is it just a, or is that a reinvention of an old uh, operating system that they're trying to get reinvent itself back into the market? Well, I don't know. I, I don't know for sure. I think it was a uh, it was an open source uh, project that Mozilla was involved in, and now they've gone. They've, I don't know why they were calling it Boot to Gecko. Uh, I, I really don't know the history there, but you know they have they have now adopted the Firefox OS is officially the name of it. Sounds like an yeah, all we'll commercial. Boot the Gecko. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we'll now start seeing ports to our common Android hardware. Most so, uh, what do you guys? Well, Smart is a pretty big telecommunications company in, in Asia. Um, I, I know they're definitely a very big powerhouse in India, the Philippines, and I think the Hong Kong, in Hong Kong. So, I definitely that they think that um, you know if that's something that they're trying to push out there, they, they might be able to put some major headway into there. Uh, Deutsche. Telecom is also T-Mobile. Uh, I'm not sure how. USA, yes. Yeah, I'm not sure how much the mother company influences it, uh, the uh, U.S. subsidiary. Um, but surprised. yeah, you never know. Uh, that, that might be a real great um, way of introducing some major competition. It's now it won't be just iPhone and and uh, and uh, Android-based phones. It's going to be that and maybe Firefox. Not to say that I wouldn't love BlackBerry to be in competition, but they really haven't had a chance to reinvent itself. Yeah, you're cutting one major, uh, not very large player out. Windows Phone Seven. Oh, yeah. point five. Excuse me, my bad. Yeah, I. Well, I might be getting you know, a hand uh, soon. So. 
I, I read a real interesting article today. I know I shared it with Bruce, uh, and Bruce had already seen it, Bruce and Matt. Uh, uh, the Verge was talking about uh, uh, Palm and, and uh, Verizon, and basically Verizon ordered a bunch of uh, web OS devices 13 months after they promised they would, and uh, then uh, you know, uh, uh, Palm's making all of these pre's to be shipped to Verizon, and Verizon cancels the order. And Palm stuck with all of these uh, Verizon-specific pre's that, Bri that Verizon's not going to take. Uh, you know, uh, I thought that Verizon was supporting WebOS. My point being in that story that, you know, it's easy to say that Smart or this Telecom or uh, any of these are supporting this new uh, Firefox OS, but, uh, you know, we'll just have to wait and see how many phones actually appear in the spring door. I don't know. It's going to be a hit or miss operating system, I can tell you that. All right. Yeah, I agree. I agree with that. So, okay, guys. Uh, how are we doing on time here? Oh, we're doing great on time. Okay, let's talk just a little bit about uh, this is something I actually wanted to talk about last week and uh, didn't get a chance because of uh, we ran out of time. But I want to talk about Google Plus history. This is a feature that's coming to the Google Plus uh, social network. Uh, Google wouldn't want me to call this a social network, but uh, it, it is a feature that uh, is going to allow you to share your other activities on the internet directly to Google Plus. It's my understanding in reading about this that just like the photo feature now, when you take a picture from your Android phone, it can automatically upload to your photos, but it's not shared with anyone until you share it. My understanding this is how this new API is going to work for Google Plus history. And uh, I'm just wondering uh, what you guys think about this. Is this is this the boost Google Plus needs? Does does Google Plus need this feature? Well, well I'm not really sure myself. Um, I was uh, I, I read an article. And I think it was by Mike Elgin, if I'm not mistaken. I don't remember the article. And I was reading about it, and it, I had to read it twice because I still I kind of understood it, but I didn't. I, I was like, is this like any other plugin that brings it over? But then I, I kind of understood how it shows. You know, um, like it shows your history. I guess like a timeline, not to throw in a Facebook <laughs> reference, but I, I apparently you you can see like your history from other networks and, and integrate them. I'm not sure if that's how it's supposed to be meant, but the article was kind of complex, and I was kind of like, okay. Blonde. Yeah, I, I guess I really misread that then because I thought it was the exact opposite. I thought it was you put a post on Google Plus and it automatically flings it to your other services. You know, I've got one of those love-hate relationships when it comes to things like that. You know, there's that balance that you want to keep between keeping privacy and then keep tracking things online. And I think that's one of those things that people who are concerned about privacy are wondering, hey, do I have to worry about things going online? The reality is everything's being tracked. At least Google is trying to be more forthcoming, saying, hey, here's a way that you can take control of it yourself. Yeah, I'd agree with that. They're going to have to be really careful about making it really transparent and uh, addressing privacy concerns. But on the other hand, I think it could be just the uh, sort of lubrication to make uh, people slide over to uh, Google Plus and carry their content over there a little more. I've heard recently about, like, Facebook uh, ports, you know, over to Google Plus and you know, there's a point where people are getting really fed up with uh, with Facebook right now, and uh, while Google Plus isn't really pushing itself that hard into being a Facebook competitor, a lot of us use those Google Plus products, uh, uh, particularly a few of them, you know, Gmail, uh, Calendar is getting more and more popular, and then as people start breaking the plane into some Google services, they realize there's a lot more there. Google's really... Uh, doing a lot to start moving into enabling uh, some of the Google Docs features. They're doing amazing things with, uh, with the uh, Google spreadsheets now that are rivaling access database functionality. They're doing a lot with Docs that uh, is really interesting and is really straightforward and easy to use. And I think with getting into uh, with the, the uh, Google Apps domain systems and getting into education, 
I think they're really sowing the seeds of taking over uh, uh, some of the market from Microsoft in in, uh, in the office share of the market, you know. Uh, and I think when people start moving over to use those products, once they've broken the plane into the Google space, they're going to want everything to be available there. And if you make it easier, it's just that much easier for uh, for Google to hold folks there and not have them stray into other spaces. Uh, I'll tell you what, Matt. I actually think Google is trying to reinvent itself. I think... Um you know, because early in the beginning, they were doing some major hardcore advertising about Google+. And I don't remember them saying it was not a social networking uh, site. Mm -hmm. And to say that it's more of a history thing now, I think they're just trying to find a much more relevant way for people to try and use and integrate it. Not just necessarily as a social platform, but somebody something that somebody wants to use in their day-to-day -day lives. They've already started, you know, consolidating all of their stuff so it integrates with Google+. And now that they see that so many people are using Google+, ooh, that looks really bad. So how do you figure well, out a way to reinvent it so it's still more practical and people want to still integrate with it? Well, and their I biggest think, asset is their products, though, you know, is their, mm -hmm. their incredible line of products that are open and free available, you know. It's a huge asset of all the development they've done so far. And, you know, they've, they've said early on, at least at the maybe not so much in the uh, marketing uh, level of things, but that Google Plus is supposed to be the portal of all their products, you know. And you see now with them doing away things like iGoogle, you know, where, mm -hmm. where we had sort of widgets that interacted with everything and that was our go-to place. Uh, I think that they're trying to move everybody into that space and, and maybe iGoogle was really looking to go that direction too when it was really kind of underwhelming, you know, and... Mm -hmm. uh, didn't really caught on. It was a little awkward for some people, and I think moving people in the Google Plus space and integrating that with a with all, with the social interaction, whether you want to call it a social network or not, uh, the the sharing aspect that's involved, uh, you know, and just the uh, huge leap of bringing things into circles where you have very targeted audiences. I mean, I think they're making a huge leap above everybody of being just an end all, be all, one stop place for all of that experience rather than it being fragmented through all these other services. Well, do you think it's intuitive? I mean, I, I mean I'm mean, i a technical person. At least I, I consider myself much more advanced than Joe User. But do you think Joe User can really sit there and figure it out without someone hand-holding him the first time? How many friends do you know who are big Facebook addicts that you kind of coax them into a little bit, you know, trying to lube, you know, lubricate their way into the whole Google Plus, uh, Google Plus scene, you know, before you really thrust them into like the big harder core stuff like Google Hangouts and other stuff like that. Yeah, Google is, has a little bit of barrier for just people figuring it out. I mean, you know, it's sort of it's it's a little intuitive to other social networks, but it's a little different. It's a little off. I think people just jumping into it. But uh, you know, part of the problem is that it's changing all the time, so you can't teach somebody how to use it. That's <laughs> that's a good point. Yeah, you're I right. Think, I think once it settles and once they've kind of got it in a place that seems to make the most sense and integrate all the other uh, products with the least barriers, uh, then then I think will be the time that it'll be a new jumping off point of, of then uh, marking that space as, as more of a, uh, uh, of a distribution product rather than this huge beta experiment we all seem to be a part of. You're a man of wisdom, Matt. The people that I've showed, whether it's Google Docs, now called Google Drive, or Google Plus, it's been instant, yep, I like this, we're going to do it. Um, I've showed people all over the country uh, how to write instructions in Google Docs for whatever uh, need we have to have instructions for. And when they see that we can write in real time on the same document at the same time, and then we'll talk about it with a voice over IP client, whether it's the phone or Skype or whatever, they go, yep, this is working, this is good, we're hey keeping notes. this. Yeah, I've not had anyone go, you know, I, I just can't use that Google Calendar. It just doesn't work for me. Everyone that's tried something from that environment, that big provider we call Google, they've liked it. It's And I've gone with people with, with various skills, and they, I haven't had a no yet is the, the one thing I keep thinking of. Now, my um, favorite part about the new Google or about Google Plus is their close knit integration with, well, I could say all of their products, but their main one I would say is Android. And the nice part is I can basically be in any app with a share button and send it straight to Google Plus. Facebook is starting to get there, but it's still a little bit harder than it should be. 
Yeah, I think uh, I, I guess what I'm after in this uh, in this Google history is uh, you know listen I uh, this isn't any secret to anyone who knows me I'm not a big Facebook fan but with that said uh, I know a lot of people on Facebook so uh, it's hard for me to get around not using Facebook uh, I've always loved Twitter I guess what I'm wanting is a solution to where if I want to post to all three uh, places at the same time from from one of them that's that's what I'm after in an API and that's what I'm hoping Google is delivering to these developers to to finally allow me to be able to do that that's not to say that I want to do it all the time but there's a lot of times when I want to share something and I don't want to have to share it three times in three different places I want to share it once and let it go to those three places you know although that kind of makes it so you're not interacting with the other people on those other two social networks you know I might so. not interact at that at that moment but yes right. I would uh, yeah that that's kind of what I'm after yeah uh, I'll tell you what uh, we're running out of time here I'm gonna I'm gonna skip some stuff here this is something that was a suggestion out of the last show that I thought we'd try to start this time and we're going to talk about rumors and the first rumor that I've got is that uh, there's a Nexus 10 tablet coming this fall for a price point of three hundred dollars uh, I'm asking the panel is this room true or false according to your opinion plausible very <laughs> very plausible very probable you know. however in the time frame that is mentioned I don't know if it's going to be an Asus tablet or it might be another Samsung but uh, if it's done something, it's not going to be another Nexus 10 inch. I, I think definitely something else is going to be out there. Well, well if you look at inches, the, now, they're in we'll the probably see 12 inches soon. 12 inch tablets. Yeah, I think we're already seeing them. I think was it LG who made a seven? What did you say, Matt? Uh, I said, why stop at seven inches? Now they're in the market. There's no reason not to compete with everybody. They came out big. They got a big product. It's going to have a lot of momentum at that price point. They can launch another uh, product that's competitive at a really low price point. You know, then they need to carry on with the momentum they've got. I think. Well, Matt, while size is an important aspect in, in many things, um, people are sometimes put off with that, and you know, they like something that is just you know the right size for multi-purpose needs. You know, I'm not even not sure that, what that you're you know you can you know carry it on the plane and stuff. But you know, sometimes it just needs to be just right. And and it's how you use it that really is what's important, Matt. Well, oh my God, you can tell I'm a 14 year old. You might yeah. expect that comment from a man who waxes his eyebrows. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm to move on. <laughs> okay, okay, back to tablets. <laughs> me, I'm thinking that seven inch for me is a weird is a weird place in the market. I think that they probably were able to jump in the seven inch, make it reportable. Uh, get the price point really low, get in people's hands that don't like carrying around a new device, and get a lot of people into something that I think they're going to like. But for me, being a, a user, you know, I've got a, a, you know, an Asus Transformer, I've got uh, you know, my, my phone. For me, why do I need another gadget in between? You know, like, to me, it's kind of a weird in-between gadget. Like, my phone's already you know, the small gadget that I try to make everything work on in that space. If I need a little bit... Uh, if I need something to actually be a true article reader and something that I can share with and and uh, interact uh, with on apps, it's a larger screen. I mean, I'm looking at it more like a 10-inch tablet at least, you know. And uh, I think that the 7-inch thing was just a weird kind of market niche that they jumped into. And to get into the to the real deal market, I think they got to get back up to the big 10-inch for you, Joe. You know, the main like part of this is its book size. It's there book you size. Go. Sometimes uh, it might be too much of a handful for some users. <laughs> oh, gosh. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what's the truth. You know what? That's going to play perfectly into the next rumor. This is one that just keeps uh, bubbling back up to the top. Apple is going to bring a 7-inch iPad in October. True or false? You guys in on that? True, because they need something to compete with this new Nexus 7. That's for dang sure. Totally. And the Kindle Fire. And the Kindle Fire. 
yeah, totally, exactly, totally yes. false on the uh, on the whole Apple thing. Um, I, I never actually believed Steve Jobs when he said he'd never do it. Uh, you know, Apple has a history of saying one thing and then doing another, but then they use really flashy words like "I'm going to re we reinvented the screen" or "This is just an amazing you know screen quality" or "We just yeah, copied the magical, yeah. magical." Yes, that's my my favorite word. You're right. A so, magical reinvented um, seven inch tablet that looks exactly like this Nook tablet here. I I think they're going to follow the same. Uh, methodology that was such a success for them in the past. They were only planning to do one iPod. And then came the iPod Mini, the Shuffle, and I don't know, well, on the Nano, and all the other little gadgets here and there. So I think Nano they're going to they're going to do classic. it. Uh, they're going to say, well, it didn't work then, but we reinvented it, so now it really works. But the iPad 3, I know it's called the iPad now, but it's the third generation one. Maybe that's what they're going to the call it. The new iPad. is The new thing. iPad, yeah. That was a Steve Jobs baby. They put all their eggs into that. I don't think they they had put the time or the resources to really put in that 7-inch tablet, at least under Steve Jobs' reign, at least not yet. There's no rumors that, I, that I'm aware of that people have been purchasing a 7-inch size panel, uh, IPS panel. So will they do it next year? I think it's pretty probable. But could they possibly make an announcement in September? I don't know if they're going to come out with it this year. I don't know. They might come out with it by thing. Christmas. They're going to look kind of desperate when they do, though, like they're coming back to chase Google again. And I think they might be segmenting out their market from their regular iPads, and I think it'll probably be a mistake for them. Yeah, right, right now. Right now, they've, they've kind of got uh, their business model has been to, to discount the previous... Uh, you know, iPad. Like right now, the iPad 2s are discounted, and then you buy the new iPad, it's, that's your premium. And, you know, let's face it, that business model's worked pretty good for them thus far. And, yeah, you're uh, right. If Asus, I, I, in conjunction with Google, could develop in four months this Asus Nexus 7, maybe Google's waiting, uh, maybe Apple's waiting to see how the Nexus 7 really, really does and takes off, and could they be as light on their feet to come, come up with... Uh, and, and, you know, with a mini iPad, you know, by Christmas time anyway. Maybe, you know, we'll see. Okay. Now, one thing I do think we will see on the fourth generation iPad, actually, is a normal aspect ratio. Instead of a 4 by 3 screen, which is completely outdated, in fact, they're phasing it out, I think we're going to see a 9 or a 10-inch iPad with a 16 by 10 or 16 by 9 aspect ratio. Yeah, I think that's I think that's possible. I do agree. Or with sorry, you. nine by sixteen, because they'll probably have you hold it like this. Yeah. yeah, that's good. And then Asus and Samsung can sue them for copying their yeah. their shape. Ding. <laughs> okay, guys. Who made the patent first? I'll tell you what. We're going to wrap this one up. I really appreciate you guys. Appreciate the viewers. And uh, let me close this out by by saying this as soon as I can find it here. Okay, uh, this is uh, Tech News Week, and uh, uh, everyone that's been hanging out here is from uh, the Google Table Plus Squad. Hangout Tech and Coffee, and uh, you can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, as well as G Plus, and I uh, hope everyone has a terrific week, and we'll catch you guys next Thursday night. You guys have a great weekend. Bye-bye. Thanks, dude. Sorry, I'm doing a yeah. shameless plug here. Shameless plug. <laughs> <laughs>